Pare Bolorin, șat urahen de stesnel tu moium, urahen cu reca, urahen cu rehete, vom mai merge jot sa rumnerin, sa arten ieror tarine, inchmenk, mi anumenk, voschetiranin, mi jot sa rumnero vor încanz ca să fumen gentronum, ai să încam dacă linent te filmeri cu sa drțuneri, te masterclasses, voriți vor araci ne ca să ai celel, cu nenea închievăs ierec masterclass, nu o să nai, bija genai, e vara mahtarani. Masna cu ciamp, urah că linie exes că chin tesnel. E ai sor batsumenk, meș tumoium, tirani sezonă, când trăm ca paruțuner. E pohan sumem, hosa pohe im colegai, neșanin, vor râd că ne-i caiațni, mai ai sorva patva vor hirin. So, what can I say? I mean, we here at Tumor are greatly honored to have Rob Nilsson with us today. Uh, for those that don't know, Rob Nilsson is the first American to have won both the Camera Dior at Cannes for his film Northern Lights, which he co-directed, as well as um, winning the Sundance Film Festival Award for his film Heat and Sunlight. Uh, I asked Rob if I could introduce him as a uh, true realist filmmaker. He corrected me and he said, no, I'm a dependent filmmaker. Uh, he relies on others. He is nothing without those around him, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let me go ahead and cut myself short and <laughs> pass it on to Mr. Nelson. Thank you. So yeah, that's a good, uh, a good way to start because guess who's the most independent filmmaker of all? Uh, probably Warren Beatty, uh, Spielberg. Everybody's independent today because they feel that independence is uh, some, some kind of a mark of valor. But um, I think the real valor is to know who you're working with. And the real strength is to be dependent on people that you know care about you and you care about them. I think that's the only way for filmmaking to be fully human. For example, I look at, I look at cinema more like poetry. Now, where does, a, where does a poem come from? Well, nobody knows, right? A poem simply grows. It's but it comes out it comes out of a person's soul as a movie has to come out of a person's soul as a, as it it comes out of the group that he's with so i'm dependent and i know i want now want to know what is a tumo <laughs> so i tried you know okay so for my next next joke i will um I was, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit, and then I'm going to show a little bit of my latest film. I found out that uh, due to the scheduling, I'm supposed to be at the screening of this film that I'm going to show a bit of at 7 o'clock. So this, this may be a little bit short, shorter than we expected. But, uh, I'm, I'm going to be informal. You be informal as well. I know what I know. I know what I think I know. But uh, I don't know what you know, and I don't know what you might want to know from me. But uh, the first thing I said, I'm dependent. I don't believe in a, a, a godlike movie director. I believe in an ensemble. I believe in a, in a group that has a mission. And I believe that cinema's, cinema is a mission. It's not entertainment. I, I, I'm not entertained. I'm sorry, I'm not entertained by cinema. In fact, the reason I don't really like cinema is my grandfather was an early documentarian in America and all I knew about cinema was all his equipment was in my mother's basement and was all in the way and I never wanted my mother to be working with my with her father I wanted the basement for myself where I could play my games and everything so to begin with I had a bad impression of cinema and um I still do. I'm much more interested in you than I am about the film I might make of you. I, lo I'm, I'm, I grew up, I started as a poet. In fact, those of you who are interested in my poetry, you can get this on Amazon or you can get it on Barnes and Noble. It's a compilation of my life's poetry. And so I think, I think it's a kind of a solitary communal venture to make movies. And um, 
I like the fact that that's a paradox, that it's both personal and deep and as deep as you can make it, and it's also as communal as you can pull together. I've worked, w I've worked with a, a cinema collective in uh, the 70s called Cine Manifest, and we worked exactly like, by the way, can you all, can you hear okay with uh, the simultaneous? And those of you who don't have simultaneous, you, you might speaking too fast or whatever, your understanding, okay. Uh, I worked with a, a collective that wanted to make films about everyday people, or wor wor films about uh, working, working people, films about people with political struggles. And we made Northern Lights then, and we made uh, another film um, uh, about a factory worker trying to decide whether or not to join the strike. So deeply personal, deeply communal. If, it, if you don't have either of those intentions, then, well, we could still be friends, but, but you wouldn't be doing things, you wouldn't be in the camp that I believe in, which is that, the, that there's a mission to be had I can't define the mission. I couldn't tell you what to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to say next. But I think still the, uh, the miracles of the ordinary, the things that happen, the small gesture of uh, I don't know. When I'm with my students, I'm saying now, forget what you're saying. I tell them to gap out. I tell them to. You know, I think that the cinema has to be surprising. I think we have to surprise ourselves by not being linear, by not going. Here's a, here's the thing I use when you know the the film High, High Noon. Some of you have seen High Noon, yes. You know the film High Noon. If you don't know it, it's a yeah, Gary Cooper's at one end of the of the of the street, and the bad guys on the other end of the street and they're going to walk together, and then they're going to draw their guns and shoot, right? So I tell my, my people, I say, don't ever walk in the street more than a couple of steps. There's your opponent there. You go over here. There's a building. They can't see you. You sit, you sit by, by maybe by a little fountain. You take a drink. You think about, why am I doing this? What did my, love, my loved one tell me about this duel that I'm going to fight in this movie called High Noon? And you scratch your head and maybe you realize that uh, you're hungover. See, these things, it, and then you come back, and now you see your opponent in a different light because you've filled your, your mind, your body, your soul with input from another place. And it's not rational. It's instinctive. Filmmaking, in my view, should be instinctive. We should be working with energy. We should be working with joy, rage, despair, intimate connections. These are the things I teach in my workshop. To not tell me what you think, not tell me your life story, but can you pull out of yourself the feelings that our animal natures have, have provided for us as the ones that are the strongest? What makes the hair come up on your, on your arm? What makes you breathe hard? What makes the blood pump? These are the things that, to me, cinema should be about. And sure, it can all be about many other things that you can learn. But if you don't have the blood in it, if you don't have the, if you don't have the, the energy, what does it take to make life? It takes, it takes the sun. Sometimes I think I'm a worshiper of Akhenaten, who, as you know, was the, was the pharaoh who said, no more multiple gods. From now on, we have to worship the sun. But the sun and water make us who we are over millions of years. And we have to find that in ourselves, I believe, to make a film that will resonate and it will feel alive. Because if it doesn't feel alive, I sometimes think that young filmmakers, for example, they'll do a film and it's, 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 I look at it as a container, like a brown paper bag. But when you go up into the bag, there's no, nothing there. There's no pressure. There's no. Uh, Here's my soundtrack. There's no, there's the, 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 I think you know what I'm saying. I'm talking about the necessity for, if it's intense, if it's so, so, 
so small and tender. The horse loud and it's furious and you know how to do, you know how to move from one to the other. <laughs> it's, you can laugh at it all. These things I try to teach my students to, to know, to be a student of, of the, we call it cathartic emotion, right? The Greeks knew about this. They knew that we were, we were looking for uh, uh, an experience of transformation of some sort. And so in, in my workshops, that's what I look for. I don't care that necessarily what the story is. What I care about is, the, is whether the blood is pulsing. So that's one thing, I think. And um, I was having lunch today with, uh, with Liana. We were in this restaurant. There's only two people, big, big empty restaurant. And I, I looked out the window, and I saw the trees were waving in the, in the wind. And I thought about a time when I was a young man. I went to a, a club in San Francisco called Black Hawk. And I went to hear Miles Davis. This was a Miles Davis uh, sextet. So those of you who know small combo, combo jazz. So I got to hear Miles Davis. I was 20 years old. They had the chicken wire was there for people who, who couldn't drink. And they could sit behind the chicken wire and watch the music and listen to the music. John Coltrane, Cannonball Adderley, I think it was Bill Evans, Paul Chambers, and Miles Davis. And Miles Davis that night, those of you who know about Miles Davis, very temperamental. And he didn't like the audience somehow, and he turned his back. He refused to play, and he stood like this. He stood against the wall while his um, players played those great tunes like from uh, Kind of Blue and all of the great stuff. And as I was thinking of this, I heard Miles Davis' trumpet in the room. Whoa, how could that be? Why, how could my thoughts have, have made that they were playing in the back room a song by Miles Davis? That to me is uh, a moment of, of a kind of a ordinary miracle, but something that makes you think. Hmm? It's kind of a revelation, uh, a, connect, a connection that has memory in it, it has youth in it, it has age in it because I'm now old, and it has uh, there's a whole reference that, that I think it's important to be thinking about in cinema. The other, the other quote I would say that I would, would want to uh, give you is um, Fred Wiseman. How many of you know who Fred Wiseman is? How many, do you know Fred Wiseman? You, you don't know him. He did uh, many documentaries about, uh, he did uh, Titicut Follies, and he followed, uh, he's a documentarian of, of different schools and different people. He did a thing on the, on the uh, ballet corps, uh, on the, uh, the ballet corps of the French, or is it the French ballet? I don't know, a re recent beautiful thing. Anyway, Cinema Verite, he said, why would I want to make a film if I already knew what it was? And so one of the other things, I'm just rambling here, but one of the other things that I want to say is don't want to know too much. Find out what you want to know by doing it. Find, don't, if you set yourself, if you set your mind to too much memorization, that's what it'll do. Then you have to repeat. But you never want to repeat anything in cinema. You want to find it and discover it in the process. So in my process that I call direct action, that's what I do. I try not to know. I try to intuit and find a starting point, and then I, then I start to, to seek what the scenes will be. And I'm talking about dramatic film. Right? I'm, I'm not talking about documentary. I'm talking about uh, working with, as I've done, I worked for 10 years with people from something called the, the Tenderloin in San Francisco, which is a place for the humanity the broken people, the drug people, uh, the, skip, the, the, the mentally, what are, what, what are these? Uh, are these from cell phones that just go off? Yeah, I, it, just, it just breaks my, my attention and because uh, my attention is easily broken. What was I saying? Yeah. In the Tenderloin, I went to the Tenderloin. Why did I go there? The place for the broken people where they 
people coming out of prison go there. It's a whole community of the, of the lost and forgotten. I, I went there because my brother had been missing for 10 years. And, uh, and so I was afraid of the area, so I decided because I was afraid of it, I had So I was hoping to maybe find my brother. A society called him a paranoid schizophrenic. You know, you know what? I can't really do this if people are talking the whole time. Up there in the back, you know, you guys are just. just <laughs> uh, sorry. Maybe I'll maybe I'll just look this way, but maybe I'll be over here because when you're talking, I get distracted. Okay. Doesn't does, you don't have to be here, you know. I didn't ask you to be here, but if you have to talk the whole time about something else, then or maybe you're translating. I don't know. Maybe maybe you're doing something you should do. But but anyway. I went to this place because I was afraid of it and because I thought I might find my brother there. And I didn't find him, but uh, I, f I found people there that uh, wanted to make movies. And how did I find that out? I had a movie called uh, Hope for the Fourth Ace. It was about a, a, uh, a Vietnam veteran and a lottery ticket. And this guy would every every uh, morning buy a lottery ticket. You know, in America we have these scratch-off tickets where you, and you try to get, in this particular game, you try to get a poker hand. The best poker hand you can get are four aces. So you have these, this card and you scratch off a number. And you scratch off another number and another number and another number. And then at the end, if you have the, the good hand, then you can take it to the grocery store and get money. You win, you can win thousands of dollars this way. So anyway, I had Danny Glover and I had Whoopi Goldberg and I had, I had Armando Sante, Peter Coyote, and all these people that were gonna be in my movie, they all signed uh, a card saying they would be in it. And, but the stock market was bad, we couldn't raise the money, we didn't make the movie. But now I had been in the Tenderloin for this period of time. And so there was a group that uh, I went to speak to in a halfway house. And these people trying to leave uh, the Tenderloin, trying to start a new life. And they said, why don't you set up a workshop? And I'm thinking, yeah, I want to I find my brother. I'm afraid of this area, but I'm starting to get a feel for what it is. And you'd like to have a workshop. So that started a whole phase of my life. And I never stopped from that point on being interested in the ordinary, everyday people what they felt, what they said, and what they could do as players, not as actors, as players, as people that, that could be full of these emotions I've been talking about. And they could give them under a, under a condition of trust and a condition of, uh, of, of, of us working in a collaborative way. Uh, and so for 10 years, we, made, we worked together. And we made 10 feature films in that time uh, all based on my, my, what I call direct action. I'll just tell you a little bit about what that is. Then we'll take a look at my latest film that doesn't particularly look like the ones that I made in, the, in those times, but uh, this, this uh, one that I have has some things that you're not supposed to see in it. There's some sexual activity which uh, you're not ready for, according to your teachers. Is that, you wanna see it then? Yeah, right, that's the one you want to see, right? Um, I got the idea that was going to form the rest of my life by, by seeing people once I started this workshop. Four, 30, 40 people would come uh, from different, uh, different sexuality, different levels of sobriety, different, uh, different mental illnesses, and also different forms of genius. Because, of course, as you know, there's so many geniuses around that never get a chance to express what they have. Well, what was the one thing in common? The one thing in common was that if they were homeless and if they were fighting any of the any, uh, addictions, the one thing they had to block off was their emotions. They had, to, they had to protect themselves because of the struggle for survival on the street and because of the, the issues of their own failure to be able to control their, their, uh, their, their, their deepest their addictions, their desires, their longing, whatever. 
So I decided then I would try to give that back. But I would be, I, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a film teacher, I never went to film school. Everything that I know, I learned by doing it. But I thought, well, let's try this. Let's see what would happen if, if the workshops were, were not about tell me your story of woe, tell me how awful this was or that was, but it, instead it was an opportunity to keep dignity by, by seeing if they, could, if they could find those emotions as I just showed you a little bit of uh, and use those in scenes that we would do and ultimately in the movies. And so we, had a, we created a circle. I mean, just making this up. I had no idea what I was doing. We, have a, we, had a, we, we met in, a, uh, in a, a warehouse where a couple of friends of mine that were former students when I was teaching at San Francisco State, they were young filmmakers just like you. And uh, they had a space, so we would, we would uh, bring the people in, make a big circle. And, and um, the first thing that I feel that is necessary for a, a film to begin or for players to be ready to play is relaxation. I think, I think any, any, any uh, uh, artist or any athlete would probably tell you the same. You have to start in a neutral place. You have to relax and you have to take out as much as you can the fear, the little, vo the little voice in your head saying, I can't do this or I should be doing this or all those things. You have to start with the body and you have to start relaxing the body. So I would take them all, they would lie on the floor, we'd turn off the lights, and I would talk to them about concentrating, first of all, on the feet, and because the feet have enormous numbers of, uh, of um, nerve endings there, and then just slowly bring them all the way up to the, top, to the tops of their heads, relaxing as they go, in order, in order to create this neutral sense of medit almost meditative silence. And then, after that, we would do a what I call a concentration exercise, which is uh, the first person to go gets up and sits in front of the next person, and they lock eyes. And it's just straight concentration, eye to eye. It's a very powerful, scary exercise if you've tried to do it. The first impulse is to laugh, and then other impulses are to try to get away, to start blinking, to feel, fr uh, feel fear, but if you can bear the gaze of another person. If you can truly look deeply into their eyes, you'd be amazed. Maybe, already, maybe many of you have already done it in some form or another. It centers you. It, con makes, it concentrates a kind of energy, not only in you, but in everybody watching. It's really quite, quite miraculous. I don't know why I did it. I just thought I'd try it. And so now it's part of a three, the three-part exercise I use for preparing people to shoot either in a workshop situation or in a movie. And the third part then is after each person has gone around and looked into the eyes of each, every other person. As you can imagine, if there's 30 people, this could take some time. Sometimes it take over an hour. But we're talking about everyday people, myself included, who are able to do this because there's something that happens once you start that rivets your attention. Even with boredom, I tell them, I tell them boredom is an opportunity Boredom is your friend. Boredom is the way in which you start to trust yourself and your feelings. So, there, so, so now after that, we stand in the, the person who's going to perform stands in the middle, and, I'm, and I think of four things. What I love, what I hate, what I want, what I need. And I say, do this either with language, without language, with movement, with dance, with whatever it is. Try to find that part in yourself. And, uh, and then they would do it. And, and maybe the whole evening there would be, I mean, if we pick, for example, what I love, everybody would do what I love, but not saying what it is you love. Not saying, I love the, I love the flowers, I love the sun. Or the, no. It's something else that is the quality, the, the, the essence of loving that you, can, that you can actually locate in yourself. And you feel your whole body changing. How many of you know what, who Wilhelm Reich was and what Reichian work was? Anybody? No, not Reich. Reich. It's it's Reich. Reich. Wilhelm Reich was a um, he was a Confederate uh, partner of Freud, 
And whereas Freud was se seeking mental and psychic uh, means to cure uh, people with neuroses, Wilhelm Reich said, no, it's in the body. Meditation. Not meditation, no. In the body. So, so what that means is that where your, your problem is, is linked deeply in your flesh, so that the white Reichian worker pushes on parts where you're particularly uh, ho holding. You can see, if you, if you examine yourself, you know that probably you have a lot of tension in the jaw. If you're like me, because I'm talking a lot, you, you start to push. Might be another place in shoulders and in arms. You're looking for the place where to release energy. And it's the most miraculous thing. You don't need LSD anymore if, if, you, do, if you do this stuff or ayahuasca or anything like that because you start to hallucinate. You can't help it. You're naked lying on a, on a, on a mattress, so you're kind of vulnerable. But if you trust the, uh, the Reichian person, all these things come up. The, the emotion is so strong that your, your fingers start to curl up like this and you can't release them because the, the, the stuff flowing through you, you might think of, a, of it as a pipe with water and you're closing the end of it but it closes itself. And, and then you'll start to laugh uncontrollably. And then at some point you'll, you'll start crying, how can this happen when, when you're just pushing on the body? How, what, is, what is the secret of this? I think the secret is what I've said, we're all animals. And if we can be animal in our work and release these tensions, e either if we're actors or we can do it for our actors, we have, we're more alive, we're more open, we're, we have already experienced the catharsis of our own beings. And I, I believe that uh, this is something that is good to do. I only give it to you as, again, I, I'm not a popular filmmaker, and, and uh, I, I only can report about my own researches and the things that I've done. And, and with this group in the Tenderloin, I was able to make uh, c come upon these reasons or these practices to make us all more alive, alive in the moment, alive, not in the moment of a script necessarily. I don't use scripts. I, I do, uh, I write a treatment, and sometimes I, I actually I'm a pretty good script writer, and sometimes I, I do, do use them because you don't want to, want to get caught in your own, in your own uh, notions too much. You want to change somewhat, but how I usually work is I'll write a treatment, uh, maybe a page, two pages, seven pages, Maybe I'll write out what I think each scene will do, with one line or two lines. And then sometimes I don't give it to the players at all. The players don't know, but what they do know, and the way that they become alive to this is through backstory improvisation. It's something else that I picked up, I don't know where. So let's say you're gonna make a film called A Bridge to a Border, and you're going to be a character in that film. Uh, I wanna take you back maybe six years where you were, you were living in Iowa and you're working on a farm and, and uh, you had a truck accident. And you started to say what life meant to you. For example, I'm just making it up. That would be, that would be a backstory improvisation that you would do with a camera on you because, because the important part of it to me is that also that the camera be there so you start to get used to the, uh, the importance of there being something to record what you do. And so that, that process of backstory improvisation would lead you to the day when we are shooting the film. And the way I do it, all handheld, sometimes two cameras, sometimes a couple of lobs and a boom, whatever, probably more like a, a documentary crew than, than a, a standard brand's uh, a, a dramatic crew. But I found that, that this way, uh, th there was no time wasted in, in uh, filling the hard drive with information. What everybody was encouraged to do is bring together the emotional availability that, that we practiced with the circumstances within this treatment that I provide, even though I'm not, I haven't, you haven't read it necessarily, but I've told you enough about it so that on any given scene with the backstory improv, you'll know a place to start, and then you go. Now, if this was in the theater, it'd be crazy, right? Because, because it would go on forever, and much of it would be unusable. 
and a lot of it is being starting and trying to find your your your, your level of, of expertise, trying to find the groove. Um, but we have editing, and so with all of this, you have to know when to, uh, in my system, when to put in the form, and when you have to be free and allow chaos. And I would say that chaos should be a good part of your production uh, as long as you've pr prepared your players and yourselves with enough information for uh, who you are, where you came from, and maybe what you want, and, and some of the other things, what you don't like, etc. And then, I mean, I'm doing this rather quickly because we don't have much time, but, but I think that this, this, this is something I discovered that works for me, and all my films, more or less, have been made this way with the final arbiter, the Wizard of Oz, is the editor. And sometimes it takes a long time, too, to edit these things. Most people think they can't be edited. They look at this footage, they say, this is crazy. Why, why, why are you showing us this? This is not a movie. And then I cut it, and they say, oh, I see. It's a different kind of, you, you know, it's not being shot to be edited. It's being shot to be captured. And the various movements and the various ways in which the, the, film, the camera stays still can, can be well, you see it, and you see it all the time in MTV, right? This is where where we first started to see, how, you know, for a general audience, what editing could do, and then Hurt Locker, where there's only the longest cut in that film is about five seconds. So, so I call this direct action. Well, why do I do that? I don't know. I wanted to have a name for it. Perhaps you know the name Direct Cinema, which is the Maisel Brothers. It's a documentary form of cinema verite. So. That's a kind of a basic primer of the way I've been making movies for the last, uh, God knows, 20 years or so. I now have made about 40, 48 films, about 35 features this way. And uh, just like you to know about it, it's something that may not work for you. It's if you know the early work of John Cassavetes, then you know that's one of the, uh, one of the I, I, I got to know John. He was my hero because when I first saw Shadows, in uh, when I was your age or perhaps younger, my whole life changed because I th I thought, oh, the, the cinema can be about you and I. Now it's routine. You, you guys are probably all making films about each other, and that's not. But then you couldn't do it because it was too expensive and the, uh, the film was was too slow and the and you didn't have the equipment and all of that. So in many ways, what I'm telling you is probably something you already know. But I recommend, <clears throat> anyway, that if you're, if you're interested in, the, in yourself, and if you're interested in the miracles of the ordinary and, our, and human joy and sorrow and pain and tragedy, as well as just the everyday run-of-the-mill run of things, this is a way to try it. This is the way you can't be stopped. This is the, you always have the money to do this. What a wonderful thing you have out here. You have all this gear. You have these cameras. Uh, the, the ways in which you can be, you can be, the the uh, the philosophers, the forget philosophy, just the observers of your lives, in terms of the small and and most exquisite things of human emotion and change. Look at this laboratory you have. I'm I'm sort of I'm sort of amazed. I never knew something like this could exist. And yet, if if you if if as a film person. You're not sitting in a room and suddenly you hear a, you hear a Miles Davis trumpet or something that touches you that, that way. All the tech, technology won't matter because in the end, you have to, you have to discover this, this thing that's called your voice, right? Your own, your own way of speaking, like Davis. How did I know it was Davis? Only because for years and years and years, no one could play that note. And if you start this way with each other and with, and with human beings in the raw, I think you're more likely to discover the magic of the type of cinema that you'd like to make. But if not, uh, I just thought I'd, I'd uh, let you know in a general sense what I do and, and why. So any questions at this point? Yes. No, the, tender, the Tenderloin is a, is a section of San Francisco 
where it was once uh, just a working class neighborhood. And then it started to become, uh, gangs started to come in. There was a lot of drugs that came in. And it became a, 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 a difficult place to live, a lot of violence. And also where when people were par paroled from prison, oftentimes they were paroled on the streets of the Tenderloin. And uh, so it's, a, it's, it's also a community of, of wild people. And in many ways, it's exactly what we all need is to get a little wilder because if all we're out for is, is some sort of security, I don't think the films we're gonna make will be of much value because I think fi film, filmmaking should be insecure. You should be afraid, you should be unsure. You shouldn't be uh, locked in to some idea that this is cinema and this is something that's taboo. In fact, you should move towards the taboos because if you don't move towards your fear, you already know everything. Once you move towards your fear now, now you're uneasy. And the Tenderloin is a place where you can be uneasy and wonder and, uh, and, and find things that, that uh, you might not have expected. But of course, there are Tenderloins probably three blocks from here or maybe a mile down the road or maybe a, a, another community wherever you are that could use somebody like you to, sh to help other people see the things that, are, that are, seem so obvious, but they're not until sometimes you isolate them and shoot them and cut them and, and uh, can, can display them as, as human documents to people who really don't have a way to step outside themselves in order to see what an artist sees. And to me, the, the whole purpose of, of this school would be to develop that sensibility of artists and to give you the means to, uh, perhaps with cinema, to make these excursions, these, uh, these uh, voyages into the human uh, condition, if you'll excuse me for the cliche. That's the tenderloin. Any other questions? I think what we'll do is I'm gonna show a little bit, uh, what time is it now? 6.25, I'm, we may not have much time now because I, they didn't tell me my film is playing at the festival at seven, and I may have to get out of here. So maybe we'll just, uh, th this is a film, this is not one I did in the Tenderloin. Af after I shot in the Tenderloin, uh, which was of course a free, free workshop, and everybody, nobody got paid or anything for about the nine or 10 years where we made those 10 feature films. By the way, the, uh, the, the series is called Nine at Night, and you can purchase it, well, I guess you can, you, uh, where can you purchase it? You could, you could purchase it on my website. Nine films that start at 9 p.m. About, uh, about these people on the edges of society. This is different. I then thought, well, okay, so I'm not making any money with my cinema, but maybe with people that could afford. So I went, uh, and maybe I could make a living doing this. So I went to people, more middle class people, people with money, people that wanted to return to the arts after having had a profession, and, and other people that just, that came along, put an ad in the paper, and these people showed up. And would be until I saw the people, just as in the Tenderloin. The people showed me by their, through their ex exercises and through their characters, they showed me what kind of film would be the natural film to make. So that's how I worked it here. And when they got together, I looked at them in the room, and the ideas started to come to me and it started to come to them and we evolved the story together and we're all, we're all the actors in it are all actor producers and the, the cast and the, the crew are people that I've worked with in San Francisco from time to time or all the time. And so I think you'll see this is a fairly conventional art film. I don't think you'll see uh, any no uh, idea of improvisation because I really don't care about what it looks like in the end, whether you see that it's imp improvised. The only thing I care about is, is how well was, did it realize the intention as the intention grew from production to, to editing. As the thing grew, as we started to understand what it might be, and the real thrill there is you'll never know until you finish it what exactly it was that was bothering you to make you want to make a film to begin with. And, uh, and so, Let's, let's start showing. This is called Bridge to a Border, and uh, I don't think we, you, you, can, you can see it, have your impression of it. Maybe we'll show a bit of it. 
talk a little bit, and then I got to go to the screening. So uh, let's go ahead. Yeah. The thing I do for you, Pete, is for your own good. I, I don't want to badger you. I don't want to make your life something that's miserable. Your mom did a terrible disservice to your son, and I'm just trying to make up for... I'm just trying to make up for some of the things you've been through, Pete. I want you to have a happy... a happy youth, Pete. You're only 15. I want you to have literature, and I want you to have beauty and culture in your life. What they said about you at the school is very serious. All the, they said that you're one of these Columbine type kids. And for all I know, you are. I don't know where you were before you came here. Were you in a mental institution? You know, were you, were you put on some kind of psychotropic drug so that some trigger will set you off? That's what they said about you. That's why the, they brought me in there the other day. I also know that terrible things could have been done to you before you showed up on my doorstep. You were, you, were like a, you were like a bedraggled little urchin out of a Dickens novel or something, what your mother did to you. That's why I don't want you on that damn computer all the time. I want you to do some, I want you to do real things. I want you to join the Boy Scouts, do something that's real, that's, that's natural, that's not this... <sighs> you know I hate the wilderness and bugs. Oh, you hate the wilderness and bugs. It's the world, sweetheart. It's a beautiful world. Most people, they can't even begin to understand. America can't begin to understand what's being done to us. There's no discernment. People eat, they swallow the lies that the news media puts out like bonbons. And you don't seem to understand where and who you are and where you're sitting. But the only part I have left of my sister and my family. I don't know Zero, and I don't know Alexandra, but I know you. I know you're a good boy, and I know that, I know that everything about you is, is wonderful. I know it. All I'm, I'm just, I know I'm, maybe I'm just, I'm completely paranoid, but I am paranoid. And this, let's not call it conspiracy, we'll just call it networking, all right? We're living in a, a society where there's a lot of networking, all right? And we are the products of it. Yeah. 
I got an ER call. I'm on my cell phone. Call me if you need me. Bracelets off, but you've only got five hours. Out the door, down the hall, and to the left. I'm doing this for a friend. Sure, we got time for this? We only have four hours. We gotta go see my brother. Where we based? Frida hooked us up with this warehouse, a place she used to work or something. Where is it? It's about a block from the workshop. Cavallo saw some guy poking around, so we had to move. Yeah, Kit's uh, got the truck rented. Graver's got the fuel. And uh, we'll load up as soon as we get there. How's he holding up? You'll see. members uh, the woman has worked with me on if, if you can can you find the actual beginning of the um, she has worked with me on six or seven pieces uh, an actress a trained actress from Juilliard and the other guy is the guy who's hardly ever acted before but just to show it can be done in a half an hour I don't think I've ever seen you relax. Yeah. What are you doing in here? Yeah, you got all your jobs done? 
so the others know that uh, your job is to try to keep them busy? Or make them feel like they're doing something that needs to be done? To watch them for the one cop that drives by every two hours, the clockwork? What are you really asking? If you really need these people to do something, you really think aggravating them is going to get them to do it any better? What, you think I should, like, hold their hands and sing them a lullaby? Man, I thought I wasn't a people person. I think you know the answers to the questions that you're asking me. That's what that I think. That they don't do shit, that they don't need to do anything. College boy, Vaclav, he is here to convince everybody else that they are part of some kind of valid cause that has something to do with the betterment of society. Um, I heard so much of that shit in prison from these douchebag Marxists, among other douchebags, that, uh, you know, he's got, he's got nothing to say, and he says it all day long, and they listen. Like, how does that go together? You tell me. And what do you do? It's not like you're a teacher, or you're a roofer, or you're a painter, or you're a cook. No, I'm the glue. You're the glue? Yeah. What the fuck's that mean? That means without glue, all of this falls apart. I'm curious about what it's like to go from a thought in your head to an irreversible action. Like you believe in what we're doing. A political statement. Spell it out for me. What's the statement? You got a problem with the um, establishment, the Fortune 500, the 1%? See, I don't have a problem with any of those people. Those people, to me, all they are, they're like, they're like the black kid that carjacks you, except they've got a, like a $100,000 education. So they know how to do it better. what I've been waiting to do forever. <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> it's funny. You're a lot of fun with you bitch and everybody else. using who? Hmm? Oh, fucking Viper.
experience in a, in a more meditative way, maybe. I don't know. Uh, you know, like I always contradict myself because on the one hand, I want this heavy, strong emotion. And on the other hand, I like the, the small, tender things as well. 